We're here today with Diane Glancy, author of a new book from Broadleaf Books titled Home is the Road, Wandering the Land, Shaping the Spirit. Diane is Professor Emerita at Callister College in St. Paul, Minnesota, where she taught creative writing and Native American literature. Currently, she teaches creative nonfiction in the MFA Low Residency Program at Carlow University. Among her works are Pushing the Bear, a novel of The Trail of Tears, and Stone Heart, a novel of Sacagawea. Diane has won multiple honors and awards for her work, including the Five Civilized Tribes Playwriting Laureate Prize and the Pablo Nereda Prize for Poetry, as well as being awarded grants from, among others, the National Endowment for the Arts. You can learn more about Diane and all of her work at dianeglancy.com. So thank you, Diane, for joining us, and congratulations on all of your work. Thank you. So maybe to get started, can you tell us what else you would like people to know about you? Well, I was born in Kansas City in 1941, and I have always been interested in writing. I remember even as a child making marks in my books and getting in trouble for it. There was something about writing or making marks, I guess I could say, that has been important to me since the very beginning. And I just continue writing. It is sort of my main interest. I'm very grateful for it. I've done other things. I've taught my whole life. I raised two children and I helped raise four grandchildren. In fact, I'm still in the process of it. I live right now in Gainesville, Texas, where my last grandchild or my youngest grandchild is 14. Wow. And I serve as his driver, <laughs> taking him to basketball Here in North Central Texas. You drive 60 miles for a game. Wow. I mean, it's nothing to even drive that these little towns are spread out and sports is the main fo focus so and then both my son and daughter-in-law are in the schools too so teaching and books and that have have been an interest over a very long lifetime and i'm so grateful it hasn't dwindled i just keep going i have more books i want to write oh that's fantastic wow good for you um, so let's talk about some of your books. Before we get to the new one, what are some of the previous ones that you've written? I, I mentioned a couple, but uh, tell us about some of your previous books. Well, you've already mentioned Pushing the Bear, which I think has been my major accomplishment. It's about the 1838 to 39 Cherokee Trail of Tears when they were removed from the Southeast to Indian Territory, which later became Oklahoma. Whenever I write, I always have to drive the land where the story took place. The land has some sort of memory. It's a keeper of images, I guess. I drive and I get ideas and I develop what I'm working on. So over the period of time, I drove the 900 miles of the removal trail, not all at once. I would be teaching at McAllister in St. Paul, Minnesota, and I would get a faculty grant to travel maybe three or 400 more miles and take notes and think about what I wanted to say in Pushing the Bear. Hmm. And then I would get another grant and I would get to go a little bit further. And I have so many memories of sitting beside the trail, uh, which are now major highways, by the way. And at the Mississippi River, I remember, I think it was the summer of 1992 when it was at flood level. And I sat there imagining what it would have been like in the winter of 1839 with these great ice flows and how the natives were, rode a ferry, ferries across the, um, the Mississippi River. And it just, I don't know, it was so real. Being on the land makes it very real. And when I wrote um, the book about Sacagawea, which you also mentioned, the 1804 to 1806 Lewis and Clark expedition. Um, I drove that also. It was a little bit easier because in Minnesota, you're not too far from the, the uh, North Dakota and Montana all the way to Oregon to Fort Clatsop. And I drove that in two different summers. And then um, another book I, I like is The Reason for Crows. It's about Kateri Tekakwitha, a 17th century Mohawk, 
I mean, a 17th, yes, converted by the Jesuits. And uh, I drove to upstate New York and even Kahnawaga across the Canadian border. So whatever I write, I am on the road after images and the memory of the land and the voice of the character that I'm writing about. Wow. I think I always prefer to write <clears throat> those who did not have a chance to speak. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that was a very interesting you know, way of doing research um, you know, before you wrote those books. Um, did you also find much written um, in terms of your research for the books? Well, there's a lot written about Native, about history, I mean, but not Native history. The Lewis and Clark expedition was documented by the, these large journals. I had to have a student help me take them from the McAllister Library up to my office. I think there were 20 volumes explaining every detail of every leaf and bird and animal and description of the land. But there was very short information about Sacagawea. In fact, he spelled her name about 12 different ways. <laughs> um, so, yes, there, there is information and about the Cherokee removal trail, but not from the Native point of view. Mm. And that's what I was interested in, those voices that were not recorded. That we're not paid attention to. Hmm. And uh, so that's do first person narratives of different historical characters, what it was like mm -hmm. to walk the trail of to be with be the only woman with Lewis and Clark, 33 other men traveling the, up to the northwest or Kateri Tekikwitha in a Mohawk village when she first saw the Jesuits when they were all suffering. The Indians were all suffering with smallpox. Were you able to find any current indigenous people that were ancestors of, you know, some of the people that had, you know, obviously been parts of those stories originally? I did go to the Cherokee Heritage Museum in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, because I wanted to have some of the original Cherokee in the book. But I really didn't talk to a lot of people. I wanted to go directly to that period of time in history uh, and, and to say freshly, I guess, what I thought it would have been like. Hmm. Hmm. So let's talk about the new book. I mean, the title again is Home is the Road, Wandering the Land, Shaping the Spirit. What inspired you to write that one? <laughs> well, I was always on the road. And it was a sort of home to me. The book began in 2012. I had a two-year stint as professor at Azusa Pacific in Los Angeles County. This was after I retired from McAllister, of course. And I would drive from Los Angeles to Kansas and Texas, where I have family, a daughter in Kansas, a son in Texas, and grandchildren spread out between them. And it was a two-day trip. And I wrote in the book how it was to start out from my little duplex in Monrovia, California, and go west, go east, climbing the Cajon Pass, which was over a thousand feet, and then across Arizona, New Mexico, and up across Kansas, and then also to Texas. So I just had to get something out of it. So I started writing essays about travel. Even as a child, I was always moving. My father was transferred many times. He worked for the stockyards in Kansas City when I was born. And then he got into management and he was transferred to Indianapolis and St. Louis, Reading, Pennsylvania, Sioux City, Iowa, Chicago, Denver. Uh, I, in those days, moving was much easier and probably cheaper. And they, I don't know why they did, but they transferred a lot of their people. And then once I was married, we also moved a lot. And I have just always had a very moving life. My first job was as artist in residence of the State Arts Council of Oklahoma. And every Sunday night, I would get out my map and find my way from Tulsa to Godibo or Visai or Edmond or Tahlequah, wherever I had the job. So it, was, it began in moving and it continued. In, in moving. In fact, I'm 
now moving into a, a new house here in Gainesville, Texas. <laughs> I sold my little house in Kansas. And um, they wanted it right away. So I put my furniture in storage in Denton because Gainesville didn't have any storage. And once I found a house here, I have moved my furniture out of storage and I'm in the process of moving into my new house. Hmm. So, who so that I can be a driver. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So who would you say the book is most intended for? I think any independent person who likes to be free on the road and what you get out of travel and the many ideas that come to me, uh, there is freedom on the road. Nobody calls me to babysit or drive them here or there or grade papers. I, there's a freedom on the road. And I think anybody who has to do that for a living might be interested. And it's also um, wandering the land, the, the ideas. All my ideas have come from being on the land. I mentioned the memory of the land. I always feel that whenever I travel to a place, a battlefield, for instance. I just get ideas about what could have happened there. And then shaping the spirit. Um, I don't know. I think you grow inwardly as a person. It's hard to explain and talk about, but there is a spirit to the land also. And my Christian faith has also been very important to me, which you don't always get to talk a lot about in an academic setting. It's not honored, respected. It's, I think, looked down upon if you talk about your faith. So I just always kept a lot of that to myself, but it's in the book. So um, I remember when I first got my driver's license, the freedom uh, that I felt of being able to drive. <laughs> yes. You know, as you said, there was, you know, such at that point in my life, obviously very young, but it was such a watershed event for me because uh, it just unlocked a lot of experience and uh, roaming, as you said. <laughs> So I can relate to yes. what you're saying about how, you know, driving is, you know, a really wonderful thing that we just kind of take for granted, largely speaking. So I'm so glad it's always been important because I every month I commuted between Kansas and Texas. Well, when I still had a house in Kansas, I would drive back and go through my mail and take care of the lawn and then get in my car and drive back down to Texas. <laughs> to drive Ray to basketball games. <laughs> wow. Wow. So um, here's a line from the publisher's description of the book. This ultimately is a book about land, tradition, religion, questions, and the puzzle pieces none of us can put together quite right. It's a book about peripheral vision, conflicting narratives, and a longing for travel. Um, mm. So do you think that that captures uh, the book well? Yes, I do. I love the, the contradictions and the experimentation of writing uh, because it does reflect one's personal experience about moving over the land. Um, there, I love the essay, and then I also love poetry, and to work those two together in a new way, to see writing also as I see the land, as I drive through it, the imagination expands. Oh, I could do this with words, or I could... Do, I could structure the paragraph this way or look at it from another way. So I'd like to read from a couple of the endorsements from the book. This one comes from Daniel Taylor. He says, set aside your rationalistic insistence on linearity, plain meaning, and predictable connections. For an engineer like myself, that's difficult to do. <laughs> what would you say? What would you say you replace those attributes with? <laughs> <laughs> Well, some of it is straight narrative, straight uh, essay, I guess you would say, nonfiction. And then there are times where I take these leaps when I'm at the petroglyphs, for instance, in Utah and in Sago Canyon. Uh, it, they, the essays become very experimental. And I insert, I had an argument with my son-in-law before I left on that trip, and little fragments are there of that and then fragments of the past, and then my own journey on the road. So I mix a lot of different things together 
which I think is delightful, although I appreciate Dan's way of looking at the world too. So <clears throat> this is an endorsement from Stephen Charleston. He says, in this strikingly original work, Diane Glancy takes us all on a spiritual road trip. She lets us see a fragmented landscape of both longing and belonging, a journey into the heart of identity. She shares a few more miles on the way to a home we all hope to find. So would you say that the book is about searching for a home? Not necessarily, because home is already there. It's in my car, doing my work, traveling on the road, finding the emotional landscape that I seek. Um, for instance, in writing about characters, there was always something on being alone on the road for a long time that drives you into yourself. And I think that's where my home was, where these ideas, these interpolations, these new dimensions, uh, further dimension in, in writing uh, have come from. I think my, my home is in travel. That's what the title of the book says, Home is the Road. I know my sister-in-law knows people she went to kindergarten with, and I've never had that privilege because we were always moving. I was always cut off and moving on. So I've had to find a home find landscape, find the homestead in that. In that. I, I have a line somewhere in one of my books, um, home was in the moving, something like that. My home, my sense of place is in the moving. I think that was it. So it's just the way my life has turned out. And so I had to make words about it as a substance, as a home. Writing is my home also. My family is my home. My faith is my home. So I don't know what else I'm looking for. I think I have found it in this jumble of different fragments in motion. This fluidity that I've always had in my life has become a stable home to me. I think it's fascinating how, you know, the differences in a person's childhood, you know, of you know, your type of situation of having moved around a lot versus, you know, many other people who basically stayed in the same place or the same area their entire child or maybe even their entire life. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the perspective that one gains between those, the difference in perspective that one has between those two uh, extremes, so to speak, um, is just a fascinating influence, I think, on the way we think about everything. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. Although I'm kind of envious of my sister-in-law in a way that she knows these people from so long ago. And I do not have those connections at all. There's, There's a very a important term. In There's always a little Go bit ahead. of... The, there's always a little bit of a the grass is greener on the other side. You know, you see what other people have, you know, that you wish you did. But in many respects, uh, the same people are probably thinking the same thing about you. <laughs> that they yeah, wish true. you had the experiences that you had. <laughs> so, um, as you know, many of the folks in our audience are writers. Um, so can you talk a little bit about what your experience was like working with uh, Broadleaf Books and, and who was the primary editor that you worked with? Lil Copan was the acquisition editor and also the one that I worked with. And she did quite a, an extensive work on the book. And I was very happy with it. She took out a lot of things that I guess didn't really belong or move the book forward. I like to stop and ponder a lot of things and to get on with it, I think was very important in this book. And I've loved the people at, at Broadleaf. You always look for, for a publisher that you will have something in common with. And I've had a lot of publishers over the years, many university presses and others, but I don't know. I broad the Broadleaf books has really been a great help and have helped in getting the book out also. Hmm. Good, good. Well, I know a lot of folks um, 
have had great experience with Lil and she's got a great reputation in the industry. So um, what would be the one thing that you'd like people to take away from the book? Oh, I hadn't thought about that. I suppose that home is where you find it. You can make a home anywhere, even when there isn't a home and you keep moving from home to home or whatever unstable condition you are in, there is a stability somewhere inherent within it. And the book finds that in uh, all this territory that, that I covered. And I talk about a little independent film I made, which was another adventure. And I talk about native theater. And I talk about my trip to the uh, No Dapple uh, protest in North Dakota. And so I just, I cover a lot of things within the past five years or so, maybe longer than that, that had to do with the specific travel and finding place in the momentum over the land. Place is momentum. I like that thought. That was, mm -hmm. I guess that's what, that was my discovery in that. I already knew it, but I hadn't put it in a book. I hadn't place is captured momentum. that that's exact right. thought. That's really good to ponder, places momentum. So um, yeah. looking forward, um, can you tell us anything about any future writing projects uh, that you are able to speak about? Well, I have a, a manuscript that I just finished called A Psalm to Whom, and that's spelled W-H-O-M, and then the E is in parentheses, so that it's sort of Play, off plays again the idea of home and then whom a god as whom uh, whomever he is whomever he wills himself to be uh, it again is a hybrid manuscript some essays are straight essays and some are very poetic i also have some poems in it i have some conjecture i have um just hybridization of of the writing process and it's mainly about my trip, my move to Texas, where you can drive 800 miles and still be in Texas. <laughs> and I say you can drive in Kansas, too, if you start in Kansas City and drive 400 miles west to the Colorado border and turn around and drive the 400 miles back east to the Missouri border. And it's a lot uh, about the history of Texas, about quilting. My grandmother was a quilter. She would cut up pieces of our clothing. Sometimes it felt like before we were through with them to make her quilts. And I do the same thing. I cut up different experiences and sew them together. So the theme of quilting um, is very strong also in a psalm to whom. And I stopped by, I was on my a trip east and I stopped by a museum in Indiana because I saw online they had a an exhibit of contemporary experimental quilts. And I love that. There were quilts made out of barbed wire and a child's swing set that had been broken down. Little pieces of wood were used. There were all kinds of quilts that weren't really quilts. And I loved it because that's what I do in my writing. Very interesting. Very interesting. Well, uh, Diane, thanks for joining us. Um, again, the title of the new book is Home is the Road, Wandering the Land, Shaping the Spirit. And you can learn more at dianeglancy.com. Thanks very much, Diane. Thank you.